And so today I want to share with you a a message that God laid on my heart uh, as I began to uh, visit our other churches. And I really think it's uh, poignant for where we are in this season of ministry that we find ourselves in. I'd like to spend some time today and talk with you uh, about the idea of transformation and and the importance of it. And I'll tell you, the, the, the reason for this message is that there is a, there's a question that gnaws at me, and I, I can't shake it. And here's the question. Why don't more Christians change? Why is it that when somebody comes to a faith in Jesus Christ, that in the first year or two, we see some of these changes take place? And and, and maybe some of them are substantive, some of them are cosmetic, perhaps. They start going to church, maybe they begin to tithe. Maybe they only use their bowling language when they're in their bowling league. They may even be so spiritual that they volunteer in the nursery. But here's what I've observed, and I want you to reflect on your own experience. For a vast majority of professing Christians, after that first couple of years, what you see is what you get. You're not going to see change. You're not going to see transformation. It's a plateau. It's I've come as far as I'm willing to go. And, 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 and you know what? The, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a person of anxiety and worry, and I've got anger issues and control issues and greed issues. And guess what? For the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years, however long more the Lord gives me, I'm still going to have those, and I'm, you're still going to see them because I've stopped fundamentally changing. At the same time, and I think this is part of what helps to support that and and, and provide a platform for this kind of uh, mindset, is the language that we use in what I would call Christian subculture. Have Have you ever noticed that when you meet somebody and you discover that they're a Christian, Isn't it interesting? Think about this. It's interesting to me that very early on, one of the early questions we will ask them is, so how long have you been a Christian? And if somebody says, man, I've been a Christian for 30 years, we instantly think, oh, them and Jesus, they're like this. But if somebody says, oh, I've only been a Christian for maybe the last year or so, we think, well, you've got a long, long way to go. When I, when I was growing up, um, I, had, uh, I had a drug problem in church. Some of you heard about, uh, had the same experience. I was drugged to church every single week. You know, if there was not bodily fluid coming forth, I was healthy enough to come to church and to be there in Sunday school class as well. And, and in our Sunday school program, uh, I don't know what uh, your experience was here uh, years ago, but if you had at or near perfect attendance, you got a Sunday school pin, and you would wear those pins. And there were people in my church growing up, they had more metal on their jacket than the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And we would assume, like, that's somebody who's walking with Jesus. They've got the medal to prove it. They would be the one who would answer that question, oh, I've been a Christian for 30 years, and we would assume they're really walking close to Jesus. Now, because I love you, and because I get to leave after the message today, here's what I've observed. Not always, but often. When somebody says, I've been a Christian for 30 years, what they've really been is a year one Christian 30 times. There's been some change, but by and large, what you see is what you're getting. Look, look at what's going on in the world today. People on either side of political aisles, the, the vitriol, the 
power grabs, the, 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 the tongue that spews venom. Where'd that come from? It's been there. And ironically, many of those in the church are exhibiting those same behaviors. And you go, where did this come from? It's what happens when our version of a Christian faith is a few cosmetic changes on the front end, active participation in Christian subculture events thereon, I now have permission to plateau. And I'll say, well, that's just the way I am. So today, I want to take you to a passage in the Gospel of John. And if you have your Bible, uh, whether you're here in the sanctuary or if you're, you're there at home, I'd encourage you to get out a copy of God's Word so you can follow along with me today. We're going to be in John's Gospel, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. If you're watching today and, uh, and, and you're new to a faith or you're exploring faith, there is a table of contents in your Bible or on an app or you can go to uh, BibleGateway.com. You can follow along. We would just love for you to get into God's Word and discover that the Jesus that is may be different than the Jesus somebody else modeled for you. And I'm convinced if you'll discover the real Jesus, you'll fall in love with him. So, so in the Gospel of John, we're going to be in John chapter 2 here in just a minute, I think we get an answer to the question, why is there so little transformation in Christians today? In verse 1, it reads, On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. Now that's, that's significant to me because here is, here's the concern. Some people think, well, if I really, you know, lean into Jesus and become transformed to be more like Jesus, I don't think people are going to want to be around me. I'm going to become one of those people, the, the, that religious crowd. But when you read the Gospels, you know what you find? People who were nothing like Jesus wanted to be around Jesus. Jesus wanted to be around them. There was something about him. This embodiment of grace and truth that was magnetic and attractive. And so Jesus and his mom and his disciples had been invited to a wedding. Verse 3, when the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to them, they have no more wine. Now, if we could go back into the Wayback Machine, to the time and the culture that this story was taking place in, when I got to the part where I read there was no more wine, there would have been a collective like <gasps> gasp. You would have gasped at home as you're watching this on YouTube or Facebook or even here you know, in the sanctuary. Why? Because it, that culture was what is called an honor-shame culture. You are either uh, been ascribed honor, and it's easy to lose it, to which you can then become shamed. And once you have been shamed, it is almost impossible to become un- Shamed, if that's a word. And in this culture, if you run out of wine at a wedding, you would have been shamed. In fact, uh, history tells us that if you actually ran out of wine at a wedding, you could be taken to court and sued. It was that big of a deal back then. There's pressure, right? There's pressure at a wedding. If you've had the opportunity to be, uh, experience the joy uh, of being married and going through a wedding, uh, you know that there's pressure. Even today, in a different culture than that is, there still is pressure. The greatest pressure, I think, uh, in, in weddings today are on the bride and the mother of the bride, isn't it? They, they have this overwhelming sense that this has to go right. We can't have any hiccups along the way. And so, uh, you know, they're, they're, they've planned this, they've strategized this, and, 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 and men, I don't know if you've had this experience that I did, but I learned a lot about marriage by going through the wedding process. Uh, see, I thought by virtue of getting married to Erica that that meant that I had equal say in how this wedding went. I was wrong. 
I had some ideas on what we should do and how we should do it. Um, specifically when it came to the wedding reception. I said, honey, wouldn't it be a great idea if we reached out and we could see if Kentucky Fried Chicken could cater our wedding? I mean, there's never a bad time for fried chicken. And she looked at me, I think with horror in her face, and I think in that moment she honestly was thinking, do I have to go through with this if this man thinks that we should have Kentucky Fried Chicken at our wedding reception. So uh, anybody, anybody, whether here or uh, YouTube or Facebook at home, uh, show of hands, how many people think that I saw any fried chicken there? The answer was none. It was none. So then I moved on to the wedding cake. You know, these cakes are expensive. Have you seen how much money they pay for these things these days? I figured if we're going to spend that much money, it ought to at least be something I like. So I said, honey, could we have a carrot cake? Now, when you hear me say a carrot cake, you need to know what I mean when I say a carrot cake because there's a right way to have a carrot cake and a wrong way to have a carrot cake. For starters, a correct carrot cake does not have raisins. Raisins are the devil's fruit. In the Garden of Eden, you had grapes. Adam and Eve sinned, here comes the raisins. So I'm not, I'm, I'm not down with the raisins. What do you do in place of the raisins? You put nuts in your carrot cake. They belong in carrot cake, cookies, fudge, and brownies. They say you are what you eat. I like nuts. You can take it from there. And then, and then you get to the real reason you have a carrot cake. Cream cheese frosting. I'm convinced that if there's anybody out there that wants to get a can of like buttercream or vanilla frosting and put it on top of a beautiful carrot cake after it comes out of the oven, I want you to call First Baptist Church of Jackson, ask to speak with Pastor Dallas. He will anoint you with oil and we will get that demon out of you because the only way, the only way to eat carrot cake is with a good cream cheese frosting. A layer so thick you could drop a toddler in it and they'd be up to their waist. That's what I was going for when I was going to have my cake. Anybody care to guess if I, if I got that cake? Yeah, uh, the correct answer is no. No, no, I didn't. See, I discovered that by virtue of getting uh, married to Erica, I had the opportunity to wear what she wanted me to wear, to stand where she wanted me to stand, to say what she wanted me to say, and to eat what she wanted me to eat. Should I perform all of those tasks properly, I may, at the end of that evening, actually be married to her. If I were to fail in any of those areas, the whole thing could have been called off. Some of you men, you know exactly what I'm talking about in that experience. Now imagine the pressure. I'm kind of having fun with it. Today, go back into that culture. This is a big deal. So, Jesus' mom pulls him aside. It's like, they've got no more wine. Verse 4, dear woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my time has not yet come. You go, what, what's Jesus doing here? It's almost like he's telling his mama no. And, 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 and that's not what's going on. But I think, I think Jesus knows fully the scope of what his ministry is supposed to be about. And Mary is in that moment, and she sees that moment. And Jesus sees what that moment and the trajectory that it brings going forward. And maybe it's his way of saying, Mom, I'm, I'm, I'm not just here to do miracles. I'm not just here to do hocus pocus and, and impress people. I've come to seek and save that which was lost and to announce to a lost world that I've been sent by the Father that they can be found and ushered into that kingdom. And I don't want anything to get me off track of that. And then, then, the next verse in the Bible may actually be one of the funniest verses in the Bible, if you look at it with me. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. In other words, Jesus just said, mom, 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 I'm not, I'm not just here for this stuff, mom. And then Mary the mother of Jesus, who is God of very God, hears Jesus say that and then turns to the servants and says, do whatever he tells you. Proof that there's no one more powerful than mama because even the son of God does what mama wants. Verse six, nearby, 
stood six stone water jars, the kind used for the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Now you just read some interesting detail that was in that verse. And, and I think sometimes we're tempted to skip over or to gloss over the details that are given to us in the Bible. But you know that when, when, when God um, worked through human people to give us this, to write this for us, that, that, that God didn't approach it the way that uh, I did when I was writing papers in school. I, I didn't have a certain amount of words, and so I didn't start putting filler words in there. Or, you know, uh, increase uh, the, the margins and the font, and let's triple space this thing, because I'm going to make it work. In other words, there, every word is for our benefit in this book. And so if we've been given that level of detail, we need to pause and go, well, that's painting a picture that I need to be aware of here. We've got six stone water jars, each one holding 20 to 30 gallons. If you imagine a water cooler, most of those uh, jugs hold five gallons at most. So we're talking anywhere from four to six times that size. Jesus said to the servants in verse 7, Fill the jars with water. To which if I'm one of the servants, I'm going, you ran out of wine. Why do you want me to do this? This does not make sense to me. Now we've landed somewhere. One of the primary reasons we see so little transformation in our churches today is because we are under the illusion and the audacity to assume that whatever it is that Jesus may ask of us needs to make sense to us before we consider it. He said, my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. There's, there's a way that seems right to men, but in the end it leads to death. My trajectory of thinking and his are not on the same plane and I cannot call Jesus Lord if I say, well, that has to make sense to me. And if it doesn't make sense to me, I don't know if I'm going to do it. But listen, we were smart enough to know that we shouldn't say no. Because wouldn't that be kind of a, 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 an oxymoron to say no, Lord? You can't say no, Lord. You, you, you lose the Lord word there, don't you? You can only say yes in the Lord. So here's what we do in the American church. We've got this little, this, this little trick. When we bump into something that doesn't make sense to us or might cost us more than we want, we found a way around being obedient. We use this phrase. I'll pray about that. And have you noticed that when we say we'll pray about it, rarely do we ever actually pray about it? And when we pray about it, we don't say, God, give me the faith to do a hard thing here. Shape me, grow me, stretch me. We say, and, you know, God, uh, 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 unless, you know, a, 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 an airplane lands safely in my backyard and a pilot comes out with a half of a mustache on his face, unless that happens, I'm not going to do that. And God does not cooperate with that. So he's, they're asked to do something that doesn't make sense to them, and look at what it says. So they filled them to the brim. Again, we're given detail that's important. They filled them to the brim. Get a, get a picture of what's going on here. Now, I want you to imagine how this would go because we, we always take a 21st century uh, perspective lens and we lay it upon God's word. We go, all right, you got six stone water jars, each one holding 20 to 30 gallons of water. You need to fill them up. Turn the garden hose on, stick it in here. We'll be done in 20, 30 minutes, and we can move on with the show. Or we can call the, uh, the fire department, and they can drive down here. Uh, they can fill it up in no time. No, 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 no. We need to understand, again, the culture. There would have been a communal well that they would have used. And that well could have been up to, you know, a couple of miles away. And, and how much water can one person carry at a time? So you've got a couple of buckets. And Jesus says, oh, you're out of wine? Fill, this, fill up the water uh, jugs over here. To which we go, that doesn't make sense. And so these servants, who probably already filled them up once, now are grabbing these two buckets, one in each hand, and now they're walking all the way, maybe a couple of miles, 
to get to the well. And as they get to the well, they're thinking, this doesn't make sense to me. I don't understand how filling the ceremonial washing uh, uh, stone jars addresses the issue of lack of wine over here. They fill it up. And man, you know what? Even the empty buckets after a little while start to get a little heavy. Now you're carrying back these buckets that now have water in it, maybe a couple of miles. By the time you actually get back to where the party is, your arms feel like they're 10 feet long and you drug them the last bit and you pick up the first bucket, you pour it in. You pick up the second bucket, you pour it in and you instinctively look inside and here's what you would say. That's it? I went all the way there and all the way back and that's all there is? So you grab your buckets. And you go back again and again and again and again. And finally, this thing is all the way full. Now, if I put myself in the story, I'm thinking to myself, that's a lot of effort. So after the first one's full, guess what? The second one lands at about 75, 80%, and then I say, that's good enough. Then the third one, I'm at about maybe 60 to 65%. That's good enough. If I actually get to the sixth stone jar, I will have measuring tape out. And the moment I cross the threshold of 51%, I'm rounding up and I'm going to say, that's good enough. Because that's an awful lot of effort that was just asked of me for something that doesn't make sense to me. But we read in the story where it says that they filled those stone jars to the brim. Hold that thought. We're going to come back to it. Verse 8. Then he told them, <clears throat> now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. And look at those next three words. They did so. Jesus doesn't make sense to me. I don't understand it. This isn't computing. I don't see how anything good is going to come of it. But because you say so, I will. And that perspective, that attitude is at the heart of anybody you will ever meet who you see Jesus in them because they've been transformed to be more like Jesus because they had a he said so, so I will attitude. And they were willing to put forth the effort. And they're willing to pay whatever price it would cost. It says in verse 9, And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. I want to ask you a question, because the text doesn't tell us. So let's use our imagination. At what point do you think that water became wine? Was it, you know, right out of the gate, all of a sudden, boom, and now they're looking at six stone jars of what was water and now turned into wine? It's possible. But let me tell you what I think. And listen, uh, thus saith Brian is a whole lot lower down here than thus saith the Lord. Okay? So thus saith Brian, I think, I think that servant scooped out water and had to literally walk by faith and take what he had in his hand and give it to the master and somehow in that transfer I think that's when that water turned into wine because what act of faith is it to go oh it's wine now here you go I think he literally had to take a walk of faith and you've, many of us have read this story before, but can we just pause and maybe, maybe sit with, with an elementary truth of what it means that Jesus did here? It was water, and he made it wine. He didn't put food coloring in this. He didn't improve water. He fundamentally transformed it. There is something happening at the molecular level. It, it, is, it is changing. It went from what it was to what it is. Jesus took what they had and made it something 
It wasn't. It was fundamentally transformed. It was not improved. Listen, Jesus is not inviting you into relationship with him so that you can engage in behavior modification. That's religion. It's dead and a watching world wants nothing to do with it. What Jesus is inviting you into is he's inviting you into a journey with him whereby you walk with him and engage in things that require more effort than you thought, stretch you in your faith beyond what you can imagine, but in the process, he transforms you as you cooperate with him in this journey of simply like the servants, brought water. Why water? Why did Jesus ask for water? I mean, we're in Michigan, right? If there's a problem, ginger ale solves it, doesn't it? Why didn't Jesus ask for ginger ale? Because they didn't have it. What did they have? They had water. All Jesus asked for is what you have. Just give me what you have. And I'll take what you have and make it what it could be. And he turns this water into wine. It looked different. It smelled different. It tasted different, and it had a greater purpose. And then we read, then he called the bridegroom aside, verse 10, and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. You brought out a level of wine. In other words, there was a transformation that exceeded what even the servants thought possible. This is, this is more. This is greater. Wow. And they were in awe. And I think in our life, if we kind of, you know, look at the story and find ourselves in the story, the well that we keep being asked to go back to time and again is inside our heart. Because I am continually being asked by Jesus to lower a bucket into places in my heart I don't even know about. And to draw up what is there and to take what is there and bring it to Jesus. And as we together plumb the depths of our own heart, there can be transformation. And, and, and part of that journey means that I need to be engaging in spiritual disciplines, not so I can be religious, but so that I can cooperate with the transformative power of Jesus Christ. That's why I spend time in prayer. That's why I spend time in God's Word. That's why I spend time in corporate worship and celebration and accountability with small groups and other things. So that I would know full transformation. I, I shared with you there in the passage where it said that in verse 7, they filled them to the brim. Why is that important? Look at my example of what I said. If, if I was in the story, you know, 100%, 70%, 60%, you know, and on down to the last one. If I got there, it's at 51%. How much wine would I have gotten? In other words, how much transformation would there have been? The degree of transformation was proportional to that which was brought to Jesus. If I would have begun to adopt a that's good enough mentality, then that's how much transformation I'm a candidate for. But when I say, okay, all of me before all of you, now all of me can be transformed into the likeness of Jesus. And then we move into verse 11, which for me is so much of the linchpin of all of this. Verse 11, this, the first of the miraculous signs Jesus performed at Cana in Galilee, he thus revealed his glory, and his disciples put their faith in him. Now, whether you're here uh, uh, in the sanctuary or you're at home watching somewhere, uh, or maybe after the fact, you know, four months uh, beyond the time this was filmed, you're watching it. Uh, if I were to give you a three-by-five card and say, write down a definition of what the word glory means, if I had 85 cards, I'd have 85 different definitions. Glory is one of those words we use in Christian, uh, you know, subculture, uh, but we don't really know what it means. And I, I don't have time to really unpack all of it. I just want to go down one particular spoke of that wheel. 
The word glory in Hebrew can mean the word wait. Wait. Not like pause, but I mean like size, like wait. The Bible says that no one has seen God and lived. We've only seen his glory. Let me break that down for practical terms for us. If you were to be in a room with a very, very important person, a person of government, a CEO of a Fortune 500 company, a, uh, a professional athlete, when you are in the room with them, the room feels different. You can't name it, you can't touch it, you can't quantify it, but it feels different. You know what it is? You're feeling their glory. It's the weight. It's what emanates from them and you feel the weight of who that person is. And the Bible says that what we have experienced thus far throughout the history of humanity, when anybody, anytime anyone's had an encounter with the living God, they have experienced the glory of God, the weight of him. Remember Moses? Moses had the audacity to go, I want to see you. He's like, dude, you don't know what you're talking about. I I don't know if God actually said dude, so... And what did God do? He, br- he said, I-, I need to brace you in a rock, and I will allow not the totality of my glory, a sliver of my glory, the backside, literally swoosh, to, to pass by you. But in order for you as a mere mortal to experience a glimpse of my glory, I need to brace you in the cleft of a rock because you cannot handle it. That's the glory of God. Now, how does this apply to us today? So, when we read the Gospels, throughout the Gospels, Jesus makes all of these claims. I'm I'm the only one that can take a dead heart and make it alive. I'm the only one that can bring you into a relationship with the Father. I'm the only way to the Father. I am truth. I, and I alone, am life. And he makes all these claims. And here's where you and I come into this piece. Because if, if, if this message today about transformation is only viewed horizontally, then it becomes really easy to dismiss. Because I can say, well, you know what? Um, you know, this transformation piece is all about me having a better life. And so, you know, Jesus might be asking me to do this, but I don't see how that's going to make a better life for me. So because it doesn't benefit me, I'm going to, well, I'll pray about that. But we've got to get away from a horizontal only, and we need to understand the vertical piece here. If Jesus makes all these claims, here's what he's counting on you and me to do. You ready? to give him glory, to give weight to his claims. In other words, the degree to which you are embarking on a transformational journey to become more like Jesus is the degree to which you give weight to the claims of Jesus that he is who he says he is, and that he can do what he says he can do. It's not about me. It's about the glory of God. So when we hear words from Christians where we say, well, I was born a worry wart, I am a worry wart, and I'm going to die a worry wart. That's just who I am. Well, you know Hank. Hank has always had anger issues. That's just the way he is. Listen, listen. For the sake of the glory of God, that should not be on the lips of his children. We, we, we don't have to say, well, I, I just, I'm just the water. No, no, no. I'm being transformed so that the weight of the claims of Jesus would be magnified. See, we spend so much time in the church wagging our finger at everybody outside the church because they're not more like us. Again, I love you and I'm going to be leaving. But maybe the reason they're not more like us is because we're not more like him. Because we decided and we began to use this language, that's good enough. Good enough is the enemy of glory. 
And so whether you've been a Christian for five minutes or 50 years, the question for you is not, you know, how many pins do I have in my jacket? How faithful in attendance have I been? The question on the table is this. Are you giving weight to the claims of Jesus? Do people who spend time with you, watch you, talk with you, read things that you write or say, do they walk away and go, Jesus is exactly who he says he is? Or do they scratch their head and wonder? Where in your life right now might God be asking you to, in cooperation with the Spirit of God, lower that bucket into the heart, the well, and draw up some stuff that maybe you've just left there and not really dealt with and decide, oh, that's good, now this is who I am. No, 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 that's, that's not what it's about. It's about him. Would you be willing to bring that up to the surface and allow Jesus to transform you? See, this is what this world's really looking for. Not a church that's polished and slick, has a great multimedia and online presence. What the church needs is to come back again to this idea that we are to be a people who are continuously being transformed into the image of Jesus. Hey, and just like going to the well physically is tiring and exhausting, I'm going to tell you that even going on the journey of transformation can be tiring and exhausting as well. We don't earn it. We can't produce it. But we are, we are told to work it out as the Apostle Paul said. So I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you who are here and at home that, that the Spirit of God would stir in you an appetite once again so that you would not come to the end of your life and stand before Jesus and be a three-cistern Christian when he offers you six instead. So God... We come to you now and we thank you for this passage which is so rich and powerful in helping us to understand and see the ways in which we can and should be willing to walk by faith into this wild unknown where you lead us to do things that don't make sense to us but in the process, in the journey, we become molded and shaped by you that we could be salt, light, and leaven to the world around us. God, I pray for the folks here at First Baptist Church Jackson and anybody else who's watching, that we would run after transformation, that we would not settle for good enough when you offer so much more. Stir us. Name the area in our life that we need to lower that bucket down to draw it up, bring it before you, and allow you, Jesus, to lead us in that journey of transformation. For the sake of your glory, we ask it. Amen.